Imagine if I told you that we can build bridges, parks, and public spaces for free. Our cities are defined to a great extent by the public spaces they have to offer and their built environment. Their buildings, their streets, their sidewalks, tunnels, bridges, and all public spaces create this image. These great features can be a burden on our cities because they cost a lot to build and to maintain. And most cities around the world face the same problem, lack of funding. So we were thinking, how can we as architects change the game? Is there a way to look at these and build these features in a new way that allows them to survive on their own? This building was a big reason in why I today became a green architect. As a kid, I went to visit this fantastic building called Qasr al-Kharrani in the eastern desert in Jordan. And I was fascinated at how incredibly hot this, the, the desert was on the outside and how incredibly cool the spaces were on the inside. And this was very surprising. It almost felt like this building had air conditioning. However, this 1,400-year-old building has no technology. So how did they do it? Architects back then knew exactly how to work with the surrounding environment of a building to make it survive like this. This building responds to the mov movement of the sun and understands the movement of the wind around it to actually create these cool functioning spaces. So I came to realize there's a lot to learn from there. If we were able to do all of this back then, then surely we can do way more with the capabilities we have today. So we learned from this and took it into our own projects. We therefore designed what will now be the first zero energy bill house in Jordan. And this is a house that responds to its surrounding environments, to understand the movement of the sun and the movement of the wind, to allow it to have naturally lit spaces and cool spaces without the need for energy. We also learned to work with nature in a different way in the second project. We were asked to design a house on a land that's filled with oak trees. And these ancient oak trees are all two or 300 years old. So naturally, we had to think of how we can take that to our advantage. The surrounding buildings next to us, unfortunately, had cut down those trees, carved the land, and put in a box building that just sits there without really working with nature. Instead, what we did was design a house that intertwines between those trees, making them its biggest feature, and flies out to get the view without cutting down or harming the trees. And it also, of course, was a very energy efficient house that relies on natural lighting and natural ventilation. In another example, we were asked to design a landmark building very south from here, in South Sudan, in the city of Juba. And even though we had $35 million to play with, that was still a very small budget for a building of this size. So we started thinking, how can we create a landmark building with what is seen as a small budget? So we looked at the nature surrounding our, pro our project, and we were very inspired by the mud huts that people used to build their houses from in that region. These mud huts are made from mud walls and straw roofs that not only was cheap because it's local materials that are available, but also have amazing environmental features that allowed these houses to be cool by themselves in this very hot climate. So we took this as our, as our inspiration and we built a very exaggerated large mud hut in the middle of the city that becomes an iconic building using local materials that are cheaper and also benefits from, these, from the great materials that they have locally. So the straw roof extends over our mud walls creates shading on the building, keeping it cool, and is by itself a great insulator to allow the building to cool itself even further. Having this knowledge and having this experience, we started asking ourselves, can we do more with this? Can we solve bigger problems with, with this knowledge of the environment and uh, green design? Amman's two largest towers, Amman's two largest incomplete towers, are... <laughs> are on my way to work. And I pass by them every single day, wondering what's happening to these. After further investigation, we discovered that these towers had come to a stop nine years ago because of bankruptcy. 
So again, we're seeing a trend here, a problem with lack of funding. And so we started thinking, what can we do to solve these problems? Is there a way for us with our knowledge that we can fix this and bring them back to life? Many of you don't know this, but we are blessed in Jordan. Our city, Amman, receives more than 300 days of sun per year. So the first idea that came to mind was to actually cover the south facades of these towers with photovoltaic panels that convert the sun electricity, the sunlight into electricity. What was amazing about this is that the towers managed to fit 6,500 panels, which is equivalent to covering all the buildings between Amman's six circles and seven circle with photovoltaic panels. Just to visualize how much energy that is, it's great. All of this energy would then be sold to the grid and it becomes a source of revenue for our project. So that was, the, that was the first way we start making money and bringing them back to life. The second thing we propose to do is to actually outfit all the floors with what's called as urban farming or vertical farming. And what this comprises is of these layers of water, actually, basins that have plants growing in them, allowing them to produce vegetables and fruits. And these vegetables and fruits can also be sold and they become a source of revenue. We also came up with many other ideas, but the biggest one of this was the fact that that farm was equivalent to also turning all the land between the sixth circle and the seventh circle into a farm in the middle of the city. So not only was it producing a lot of food, which also meant money, but just imagine how much oxygen we were pumping into the city right in the heart of it. We also added many other ideas, including touristic ideas and other energy generation functions to bring this project back to life. And then we started thinking now, if we were able to do this, can we take it to a much bigger level? Can we now solve world problems with this way of thinking? So I'm going to take you on a trip to London. I was actually there visiting a local friend cycling around the, the, liver, the River Thames in uh, the city. And as you may know, there are many bridges that cross from one side of the river to the other. The particular spot we were at did not have a bridge and we needed to cross to the other side. My friend actually told me that in this exact same spot was supposed to be a bridge that is dedicated to, pedestri to pedestrians and cyclists. Unfortunately, this bridge has been needed for 100 years and still has not been built due to a lack of funding. And this shocked me. We might have been used to the idea of lack of funding or these problems in our part of the world, but this taught us that these problems are actually quite universal. It drove me crazy and I went back to my team and we started thinking, is there a way for us to build this bridge without costing the city or the taxpayers a single penny? What we basically did was look at new ways of coming up with money. Cities usually rely on paying taxes and therefore they can pay for these functions. But we wanted something more renewable. We wanted a renewable income that can survive by itself without the need for people to pay taxes. So immediately the answer came, if we want a renewable income, then let's look at renewable resources. And that's where our knowledge in green design, understanding the world or the nature of the world comes into play. What we basically did was design a bridge that offers the main two functions, which is the pedestrian crossing and the cycling crossing. But what we also did was propose adding new features to that uh, bridge to allow it to start living on its own. The first thing we realized is that we will have 1.2 million people crossing that bridge. And so we thought, let's tile the entire pedestrian path with these tiles that produce energy from people walking on them. We then noticed that there's, there are strong winds that go along the river. And so we added these bird-friendly wind turbines that would change that energy into electrical energy. And even though we think that London is gloomy and it has that reputation, they actually still receive over 150 days of sun per year. And therefore, we also added photovoltaic panels that produce energy from the sun's light. The biggest element of nature that's closest to the bridge is the river moving under it. And this is rapidly moving water that we also thought we can convert into electrical energy by adding water turbines under the bridge itself. We then thought of an opportunity of turning this bridge into a beautiful park right in the middle of the city. And in that park, we actually added 
several workout areas, outdoor gyms that are free to use by the public, and they use equipment, workout equipment, that produce energy from these workouts. So as you can see, we came up with a huge amount of uh, items on the bridge that convert electricity uh, into money, because all this electricity would then be sold to the grid and come back, coming back to the project. And then we thought, maybe we can find a way to also even create more money directly. So we built these booths that can be placed on the park and rented out to people who can sell different things like food or beverages or souvenirs. And the revenue from renting these spaces also comes back to the park. Londoners have already decided to call this bridge the Diamond Jubilee Bridge. They, they call it that because they want to commemorate Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth's 60th year of running the country. So we thought maybe it would be a nice idea to add this museum element to the bridge to showcase Her Majesty's legacy and her lifetime on these screens. And then we said we can use these screens to place advertisements on them to also create more, more uh, revenue for the bridge itself. We designed this bridge to be an icon that would be befitting of Her Majesty and London's uh, legacy and image in general. And we proposed naming it the Diamond Jubilee Crown. As you can see, this particular bridge was designed exactly for London. However, the ideas behind it can be applied anywhere in the world. The idea of producing energy and money to cover the running cost of a bridge can be applied anywhere and in different shapes, not necessarily only in this particular shape. So we talked about creating revenue to cover the running cost of the bridge. But now, how do we build this without costing the city a single penny? What we did with, with, with this is that we realized that our bridge not only produces enough money to cover its running cost, but actually creates a profit. And once we say profit, we can attract investors. We invite those investors to pay for half of the bridge, and they would get in return half of the bridge's revenue and profit. We then invite people, just like you and me, to donate to build this bridge. Anyone donating will have their name carved forever on this bridge. The city would therefore get that second half of the profit, which now means that not only is the city getting this bridge for free, they're also getting money out of it and profit out of it to be spent on other great features in the city itself. So as you can see, what we did here was try to look at the world in a different way and to try to look at what's a traditional bridge in a whole new way. Just like a soccer team works together to reach a goal, we designed these elements to work together to reach the original goal of having a pedestrian and cycling crossing and even much more beyond. What we are trying to do here is to find unconventional ways to build or to solve our conventional problems. And I want to ask you, can you think of ways of us solving conventional problems that we have in our own city, Amman. My team and I are currently working on a proposal to solve a big problem that we see in our city, which is the problem of lack of parks. And I'm happy to tell you that we found a way to build parks in Amman that are free to build and free to run. So keep your eyes out, it's going to be online very soon. What we see here is that by understanding nature and working with it, we can achieve so much more than working against it. And these tools and elements of green design can really help us get there and really achieve bigger goals than what we thought we could ever achieve. We therefore like to call these tools our weapons of mass construction. Thank you. <laughs>